breaded shrimp. How are you doing, dangling? You're waiting on COVID results. Were you wearing a mask at the time? Or was the person that had COVID wearing a mask at the time? Because uh, I got exposed to some people over Christmas break that had COVID. Um, but I think we caught it before they actually got contagious. And uh, nobody in our family got it. I mean, nobody in my immediate family, like my wife and daughter. But um, I wasn't sure. We had to go get tested. And then I was doing the same thing you're doing, just waiting around. Trying to see if I had it or not. Uh, do you have any symptoms? I guess is the better question. Don't like the way that that's making lines on my image. for Simbella Kaseliki and it had junk on it. trying to figure out what this diatom is. Uh, sort of one of my missions for the day. It's a... Uh, I thought maybe it was Aprosimbella, but... It does not appear to be... connected with the intermissio the way they normally are. Normally there's like an arc right here. 
And so I think it's actually just a gomphonema. But uh, I'm going to get some good pictures, and then Itzi and I will have a discussion about it. Let's see, the central sternum is pretty narrow. The stigmoid is a slit, and it is very similar to Aphrosimbella in that way. But I'm not sure what it is. Potentially, it's just a weird gomphonema. Oh, hello. Sorry, I was busy doing stuff. Sometimes I forget to look at the uh, chat while I'm doing SEM stuff. Happy New Year's to you, Hannah. It's good to see you here. And Digital Seahorse. <laughs> COVID-shaped holes. <laughs> uh... I keep having stomach aches and headaches, but they come and go. Well, uh, when I thought maybe I had COVID, I kept feeling like maybe I had a fever, but uh, I couldn't convince myself it was real. And then test came back negative, so. Yeah. It's the, the processing right now is super backed up because everybody's got uh, COVID or thinks they do after the holidays. Uh, this is a, it could be related to the Gonfo monster, actually. Um, this is from Africa, not Idaho. But this diatom is very weird. It is somewhere between Gonfonema and Afrosimbella. It's somewhere on that spectrum. And I previously was sort of convinced that it was Afrosimbella tanganike, but... Uh, subsequently, I've, I'm not convinced uh, that that's what it is. But it's not a normal gomphonema. Um, it's a little too asymmetric, and uh, the stigmoid is slit-shaped. But it's not a very good aphrosimbella, because the intermissio is missing. Uh, the connecting piece between these two is normally sort of like a smile and it makes this look like a little cat face basically um, and that part is missing so I need to look very closely at Tanganyika and SEM and see what it looks like and then what this could be yeah a new mystery um, I probably mistakenly identified it as as Tanganyika, though. So, SP. Hello, Chippy Flip. Uh, let's see. Shout out to Chippy Flip. And then uh, I can do one of these. And I think one of these. And uh, hope everybody's doing well. Sample 001. And this is... Uh, I don't understand why I don't have a folder for 001. I feel like I've taken pictures in this before. I made some new stubs today, though. So this is Aphrosimbella, maybe? I'm just gonna call it CF Ting Ting and EK. CF is what we use when we don't know what it uh, what it is, basically. <laughs> we know what it isn't. Uh, that's basically science way of saying, I don't know. 
it it probably isn't Tanganyika, but it it's something, and I don't know what it is. So, um, some kind of a mystery. This might be a small version of it. This is an external view. It has sort of a Afrosimbola stigma. It doesn't look quite like a typical Gomphonema stigma, which is a little more central. Um, there's some weird stuff in Africa, and at the genus level, um, I think we need to kind of explore the gonfanemas a little bit better because most of them don't seem to fit perfectly into gonfanema the way we would like. This one has classic gonfanema uh, areoli, little ovals, sometimes slightly C-shaped, and the raphe bifurcates the uh, apical pore field, but that is sort of a Afrosimbella like stigma on that thing. You're chilling out before you go back to the virtual office. Um, I'm in my actual office, so there's that. Oh, I can buy followers. Great. Uh, I, I don't think I need them though. We'll we'll be fine without the bot ones. <laughs> Bruh. What's going on? Uh, disillusioned. <clears throat> It is a cute squirrel. Uh, which phrase should I add? Bruh? Uh, maybe I can just... <laughs> maybe I can just, uh, let's see. I'll blacklist the word buy. <laughs> Oh, just the whole phrase. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let me see about it. While we're waiting for this image. The, uh... The bots have changed their message. And we need to make new blacklisted words, I guess. Hopefully that fixed it. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> uh, okay, this is probably an external of that same thing. One of those things about the uh, the sample is full of these little asymmetric diatoms, and 
and they're the ones I was questioning. We we have this publication for um, for some of these Afro Simbellas basically ready to submit, and um, this was one of the things that my um, co-author collaborator Itzi wanted me to check out was whether these were Afro Afro Simbellas or not, and. Um, See, I want to go backwards. It's like so close to actual like Afrosimbella uh, central area. like almost right um, but it's got this uh, slit shaped um, stigmoid it's got curly uh, um, uh, rafi ends proximal rafi ends Let's see, I want to go like this way, maybe three degrees. And then I'll slow that down. We'll fix the brightness and contrast. There's some other things in here I still need to explore as well. Um, I made some samples from like four different sites and I was poking around in them a little earlier. There's a really rare diatom that uh, Eatsy's asked me about as well, um, and I don't know if I'll be able to find it or not, but we can give it a try. This looks like it's going to turn out pretty good. Everything's in focus. So again, this is an internal view. This is some sort of gomphonemoid or aprocimbella, and it's got this sort of classic areoli stri structure. This is the raphi. This is the proximal end of the raphi, and this is the distal end of the raphi, and it ends in a little helictoglossa, um, which is a Latin word meaning rolled tongue, like, like that. Uh, and then this is the head pole, this is the foot pole. It's a typical gomphonema shape, it's asymmetric. Um, this end is longer than this end, and the foot pole also has something called an apical pore field, um, which we'll see in a second. Here's the, uh, the stigmoid, it's slit-shaped, and then these are the proximal raphi ends, they end in the um, central nodule. The structure that's here is called the sternum, and it's sort of like the keel of a boat, basically. And we're looking at the inside of the diatom. And then I'm just gonna collect that, a little three minute photo, and I can come back to chat. everybody's having a good New Year's. Um, we just sort of hung out at home, but uh, I did some planning. I am going to build a keyboard stand for my daughter um, in my wood shop, and then also she asked me to build her a little box. Um, over the holidays she got these uh, is like digging kits, you know, um, where you f find gold, but instead of finding gold, they, they dig and they find minerals and fossils. And 
she absolutely loves this thing. Um, hey, mind of a snail. Did you get some new emotes? You've got an emote with the, the uh, animations now instead of just a rainbow. It's very nice. Um, if you're not following mind of a snail... <laughs> That's what happens when you say the word snail. Uh, you should. Um, just like uh, the other people that I have recommended. Um, I would recommend bad people. I don't. Only good streamers get recommendations from me. So, um, but Mind of Snail is a longtime friend of the channel. And uh, we've been following them since they started on Twitch. And uh, sometimes you are bad. <laughs> I don't think so. You're always funny. Um, bad in a good way. Uh... And they've got great emotes. Uh, and I always use that little woe emote that they have. Uh, they got sort of this woe, woe emote that's like a rainbow colors. And uh, I always use that one. Oh, you've got yes emotes now? Nice. Do you have no emotes? There you go. Uh, I could use a no emote really badly. Uh, that one I need. Uh, for Hannah's stream. Okay. Uh, internal large. There you go. I need some more external views, and then we'll be in good shape with this one. Uh, let's see, I'm sure I can find some. It's a common diatom in here, which is uh, nice because usually I have to hunt around forever to find something. This one's right here. That's a small one. I want a, I want a bigger one. Uh, I'm, I get greedy. <laughs> What's happened? This is where the droplet was. Uh, I, I start thinking, oh, I don't just want any old one. I want to get this perfect view now that we've got so many of them available. Why shouldn't I find one that looks really good? Um, even though it's probably not something that's going to show up in a publication. Uh, that is Kaseliki again. Seems to be the most common uh, Aphrosimbella in this sample. And unless this is a Tanganyika or, or some other Aphrosimbella, um, it's quite common in this. Um, the nice thing about external view and internal view is you can tell from a distance whether it's internal or external. Internal views look like little rubber bands. They just look like a white ring around. And so I don't have to zoom in every time. I can kind of look around. The uh, external views are very bright. Um, they look like these. They have a very bright surface. Clump. Clumps are the worst. Uh, sometimes when a... Sometimes when I'm trying to take pictures of snowflakes, the clump also drives me crazy. Because you see all these beautiful things in that clump. There's no way to separate them. Um, anyway, so I was telling the story about uh, my daughter wanting a box. I haven't forgotten. And uh, she wants to put the minerals and fossils that she's collected into a box. And to do that, she wants me to make her a box. Which is funny because I made her a box before, and she doesn't use it for anything. 
but uh, now she wants me to make her another one. This also happened, by the way. I mean, she's seven, so what they want sort of moves around. But um, this also happened when she asked me for, well, I told her I was making her a kalimba. I made her a kalimba, and then she doesn't play it. And then she asked me to make her another one. <laughs> so it's like, okay. Uh, but she wants a little one. So I'm, I'm planning on also making a little kalimba for her. The little ones are a lot easier. They're just basically a block of wood. So uh, it'll only have like eight keys or 10 keys. There we go. That's what I want. That one's nice and clean. And I want to rotate it. <sighs> Let's see. That's numbers that are bigger. Let's try like 15. Still pretty good at guessing angles. I haven't lost that skill. How far off am I? Uh, it probably could go to 17. That's good. And then uh, this is an external view of that same diatom. So this is the proximal raphe ends. The distal raphe ends are out here. That's the stigma, stigmoid, stigma. And then these little holes here uh, in a row are called stri. The holes themselves are called areoli or puncti. And then uh, this is the sternum, the middle part that the raphe sits in. Head pole, foot pole. And we're going to go look at the foot pole. Um, and this is the apical pore field on the foot pole. When there's little holes that are all together. And they're not perfectly in focus. Uh, it makes me want to get the stigmator going and try to get them into focus. A little better. So, um, gomphonema are normally asymmetric um, across the axis, um, across this sort of transapical axis right here. In other words, this end is longer and this end is shorter. And that's usually how we tell the head pull from the foot pull, because the foot pull is usually on the longer end of the diatom. It's not always the case, but it has this apical pore field, which is our, that's definitely the, the foot pull that has the apical pore field. And um, you can see that this diatom, which is why I thought initially it was an Afrocimbella, I'm having a hard time getting it like right where I want it. Um, also is a little bit asymmetric um, in the apical axis direction. Like this side is slightly more humped and this side is slightly flatter. And this is the ventral side and that's the dorsal side. And that's the normal behavior for Afrocimbella. And some gomphonema are a little asymmetric, but it's less common that you can tell like obvious, obviously like this. Um, and this one's a little bit more asymmetric than most, which is another clue that it may not be gonfanema. 
like ultimately, um, but it also may not be Afro Sambella, so. To put that to the test, I guess. Okay, view looks good, focus looks good. Brightness and contrast I'm working on. And then we'll snap a picture. Perfect. Um, there we go. John Wick, The Legend 420. This work is amazing. I commend you for everything you do here. I've been a fan of science and you absolutely love this. Well, that's great. Um, thank you for checking in with us, John Wick, The Legend 420. And um, thank you for the follow. Uh, let's see, what did I miss? <laughs> We're not into no. <laughs> uh, oh, you guys got a whole bunch of new emotes. This one's got a refrigerator. Um, to go along with your little fridge adventure. Uh, they've got a, a um, channel redemption where you can look through their refrigerator, uh, which is nice. Um, you'll be happy to know that I, um, uh, I ate lunch today. So um, before I streamed, which I usually skip because I'm in such a hurry to get everything done. Um, how little? I, I don't know. I think probably they'll just be like a, you know, like maybe this big, little, um, like half the size of the one I made you. Um, it won't even have a hole in it. It'll, it'll just be like a clipboard basically with the tines on it, um, sort of that size. You could do one in each hand. Um, if you tune them differently, it might turn out nicely. I've seen people have like a double decker kalimba which has got like all the keys and then all the keys like this, like, you know, because they sort of create this uh, structure. And, um, and I think they tune them in two different um, levels so they could have like 42 keys. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a goal, I guess, for me to figure out how to build one of those. Artful Turkey, um, you mean since yesterday? No. Uh, <laughs> I haven't gotten your, the mug that you sent me. Um, I think what it is is uh, Canada doesn't want to export it because it's so cool. That would be my, my guess. Um, they kept it, maybe, and they're probably drinking hot coffee out of it because it's so cold up there right now. Um, I'll give a shout-out to Artful Turkey. Here's Artful Turkey. Um, they're a great artist, and they actually have a great um, sort of uh, support system for the whole art community. Um, a lot of my favorite artists are either linked in with them or close friends with them or whatever um, through Twitch. And uh, yesterday they were, was it yesterday or the day before? They were painting a... Uh, a Boston Terrier, I think it was. Um, and uh, I just poked my head in there. But um, during their, uh, they had a uh, celebration stream, I think an anniversary stream for uh, two years or three years or something on Twitch. Sorry, I don't remember the details, Artful. Um, but they, uh, they did a giveaway and um, and I won a mug, and I've just been waiting for it since then, and it's been like a month now or something, uh, which seems like a long time, but I'm a patient person. I probably wouldn't have even said anything, um, except for I was worried that maybe they shipped it and somebody stole it, um, but that doesn't usually happen in my neighborhood, so... Um, it's a mystery what happened to it. I'm, I'm fairly convinced though that Canada just wanted to keep it. Um, they, didn't, they didn't want it to get exported at all. This is a uh, Afro Cimbella. I'm sure of it. Um, as you can see, it's not symmetrical on any 
uh, plane, like you can't cross um, the transapical axis or the apical axis um, and get uh, symmetry. Uh, it's roughly banana shaped, but that's um, it's not very good at symmetry. Um, and that's a uh, Simbella nitsia behind it as well. A really weird genus only occurs in, um, in East Africa. Both of these actually only occur in Eastern Africa um, at the genus level. This is an external view. It's Afrosimbella caselici, I believe. As I mentioned, it's the, probably the most common Afrosimbella in this sample. I need to clean up this image a little. Somewhere around there. Um, Probably could go backwards another degree or two. Let's see, 357 again. Uh, and then I'm going to slow the beam down so we can actually see it. This is one of the smaller Afrosimbella, and um, one that's already been described. Um, it's named after Pat Kaselik, who's actually a friend and colleague of mine, um, who works on Gomphonema, and uh, describes several Gomphonema from all over the world. Um, and uh, the Gompho monster, the, the weird diatom that we found in Idaho is uh, sitting in his lab somewhere waiting for him to make a decision about what we're supposed to do with it. Um, I don't know if he's waiting for me to write a manuscript or what, but um, it's on the to-do list. So it's not a great photo, but it'll do. We'll, we'll go ahead and take that. It's an external view. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know if the dog got painted. Esrella, aren't you streaming? Did you stop streaming? Ah, taking a break. Uh, welcome in, Estrella. There we go. Another great uh, artist to check out on Twitch. Um, Esarella does digital art, and um, she's an inspiration to my daughter, who uh, started drawing digitally um, after watching one of her streams and then got very excited about using um, Procreate to try to draw on her iPad. And um, occasionally I'll stream with her um, doing the art. Um, but I always like to catch the sterile streams. Built the spills playing in my headset. If that seems like I'm overly happy, that's probably why. Um, So we're almost to the point where we can publish our paper on Afrosimbella. As I mentioned, um, I'm, I've got five new species described in it, and um, 
checking out that uh, Tanganyike like thing was sort of the uh, one of the last things I need to do um, and it will probably mean that I have to modify a little bit of text but otherwise um, all the figures are basically ready to go all of the uh, the text is basically written I just had a few little things I wanted to tweak um, and so we'll see uh, it should be submitted I'm hoping by next week and then I've got to send the samples off to a museum and um, and then wait for reviewers to see what they say and that's basically it five new species um, and I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, when Mallory started in my lab, we had just gotten a bunch of these Afrocymbella samples. Um, so this was three and a half years ago. And, um, and she doesn't even stream with us anymore, but, um, but, uh, basically has, I've been working on it for the whole period with her. This is Kaselik. I don't know how to spell his last name. <laughs> and uh, normally that's a, that's a pretty long arc, um, but uh, for a uh, taxonomic paper, but it's just sort of where we are with it, um, which is that it's taken a little bit longer than I would have liked because. Uh, one, I had an undergrad involved in helping me, and um, Mallory's great, but all undergrads are just going to slow down research a little bit. That's, you know, they work slower than faculty do, um, and I really wanted to have her kind of directly engaged in it, so, um, uh, and I, there's no rush, so I don't mind taking a little bit longer. That's a good one. We'll rotate that around. So maybe something like this. I can still do basic math apparently. And um, so that took a little bit longer. And then also, um, you know, basically we, we started this project right after, um, it's like the, the fall after we got the scanning electron microscope. So um, that's, uh, took us a while to kind of learn took me a while to learn how to get this instrument to take pictures the way I wanted it to um, for diatoms and for anything really um, and how to prep samples um, so that the images turned out the way we wanted both of those things are a little challenging um, when you're first starting so I'd never had an SEM in my lab before that point so, um, it's going to be good. Um, anyway, I wanted to get back to the woodworking, so I'll probably do some woodworking streams. I don't know if it'll be today, but um, I got some new tools for my wood shop over Christmas break, which I'm kind of excited about. Um, and they'll allow me to make 
um, box joints and dovetail joints, and also uh, I've got a biscuit joiner. So mostly just joining tools, and then I got a bunch of new clamps um, that I'm excited to use. So um, I don't know if I'll do a stream right away with it uh, or, or not, but um, we ordered them a couple of days ago and they came in today. So um, while I'm streaming on the SCM, I'm mostly thinking about my wood shop <laughs> at home and what I'm going to do and when I'm going to do it. Because I want to try to get stuff done before the semester starts and then, uh, and then it's total chaos. Uh, let's see. Oh, the diatom in the image below me looks like a radiation symbol. Yeah, the one that we type SEM that pops up. It's a actinopticus. It's a marine diatom. Um, let's see. Uh, hi, King Ulrich. Hello. Uh, welcome in. Um, yeah, sometimes I do scanning electron microscope streams and uh, just chat about whatever comes to my mind, apparently. But I'm working on, I'm doing actual research here. Uh, this isn't just like for entertainment today. Um, so in my spare time, I'm a full-time professor doing actual science, uh, you know, around being a moderator for Pacific Plankton and, uh, and streaming on Twitch. I have a job and try to get research done now and then. Um, I'm glad you like it. Stick around. There's all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, how old? Uh, do you mean how old is my daughter? She's going to be eight next month. Oh, that's cool. Um, so she's pretty young. Uh, she's not going to be doing a YouTube channel anytime soon. Well, that's what she wants to do for a living, I think, though. <laughs> they remind you of cucumbers? I don't know. You've been eating some weird cucumbers. Uh, oh, that's pretty cool, though. Let's see. What was the spiral shell-looking scan from? Oh, it's probably a snail, Astorella. Um, we did have some uh, miniature snails on. Uh, everybody always asks me questions about the, um, the images that I have that I've colorized that are below. That's sort of my artwork side of uh, the channel. And... Um, so I take the SEM images and then I colorize them, but uh, uh, usually they ask me questions about one that's passed and th they move through a slideshow so quickly that I don't usually know what people are talking about. So um, the, uh, the black and white image, uh, sorry, it's off to this side, uh, that you see is um, the one that we're actively collecting and the ones that are color that are down here are ones that I've colorized and they're on my Instagram page. So, uh, how did the cutting board gift go over? Oh, they loved it, I think. Yeah, uh, thank you, Fall Machine. Um, I got a uh, biscuit joiner and I got a, so for Hannah, sorry, I'm catching up to chat, uh, a biscuit joiner and a, um, it's just called a dovetail jig, but it's actually a big machine that you stick the boards in and you can use your router to cut stuff with, so. <laughs> yeah, fledgling art, uh, uh, artist. Is, uh, my daughter is just starting to do art, but she's actually been doing it since she was like three. She's been drawing, but she's just, um, she's training herself now. She watches YouTube videos of people who do art and then tries to mimic what they do to draw her own things. So she's doing pretty good. Um, she's pretty good for, for a seven-year-old. <laughs> That's what postdocs and grad students are for. Well, they're all gone right now. I'm the only person in the lab because uh, classes start next week. Uh, Laura's around, uh, but she's not here in the lab. And she's not, I don't think she's in the microscope lab either. I think she's just back in Terre Haute. But um, got a brand new Ryobi bandsaw. Oh, I don't have a bandsaw yet. Um, that's one of those things that I, I put on my Christmas list and nobody wants to spend $300 for uh, to get me, so I just have to wait <laughs> until, uh, until I decide it's important enough to get one, I guess. Um, bandsaw is like, uh, it, it's 
terrifies me because it's the thing everybody tells me, oh, I cut off a piece of my finger with a bandsaw uh, and I want to keep all my fingers. So um, I'm very focused on where my fingers are and the possibility of them getting cut off or chopped off or whatever when I'm in the wood shop. So, um, but I can't cut like fancy designs as a result, right? So, because I don't, uh, you kind of need a bandsaw to do that. I guess I could do it with the jigsaw, but it doesn't look good. Okay, uh, I think we got a good idea of what this thing is. And let's see. I'm gonna do this. And I'm just going to do a quick scope around to see if there's any other Afrocymbella on this slide, stub that are not this little thing that I'm looking at. I feel like it's going to have to get moved from Gomphonema if it's in Gomphonema eventually, but for now it's probably a Gomphonema. Oh, a cool Solophora. Uh, Lake Malawi and Lake Tanganyika are filled with, that's where these samples are from, they're filled with really amazing diatoms. And um, there's really nobody besides me and a few other um, people that are really exploring them very much um, in terms of taxonomy. There's not that many diatom taxonomists out there, and I barely qualify as one, to be honest. Um, I mean, I qualify, but it's... Um, it's, uh, it's not my primary focus. I'm mostly a paleoecologist, so... All right, let's try to rotate this. Um, increasingly, since we got the scanning electron microscope, I've been uh, been more of a taxonomist, but I'm known more as a paleoecologist. But you can't really just do one thing and be a diatomist um, because there's potentially a million diatom species that aren't described. And so like, no matter what you do, you kind of have to be a bit of a taxonomist um, there's not really a choice, uh, because you have to get good at, um, doing all parts of the job, unless you just got friends who are taxonomists that want to help you, um, which I do, but even then I still need to, uh, kind of do a bunch of it on my own, so... Alright, um, this is a Solophora. And um, classic Solophora have uniseriate striae, although more recently um, there are some that have been described with biseriate striae. Um, uh, probably were described as something else before, but they were moved into Solophora. And they have this little uh, silica platform structure, on the valve ends at the apex. So here and here, see these sort of bright areas. They're the result of um, these little silica platforms. So again, for people who don't know diatom terminology, raphe is this line that runs down the middle. It ends in a holictoglossa. This is the proximal end. This is the distal end of the raphe branches. And then um, this thing's just called a platform, I think, or maybe it has a real name, but this solid piece of silica in the middle is called the sternum that the raphe is sitting in. And then these lines are called striae, and the striae are composed of little holes called puncti or perioli. And you can see um, that there's only one striae or one areoli uh, or puncta in a row. So that's what I mean by uniseriate. Uh, uni means one, seriate means like a series, so in a row. And this diatom, um, that structure right there, uh, together with the uniseriate and the platforms. And on the outside, it probably has a uh, canopia, which is another structure that runs along the middle here, um, are diagnostic for Slopher. So this is a little overbright. It, it, it's, it's sort of glowing around the outside edges. So I'm going to try to balance it a bit. And then we'll take a picture. 
don't know the name of this uh, Slothra off the top of my head. I was going to bring in the little African taxonomy book so I could kind of look through it while I was taking pictures, but when I'm streaming, I really can't kind of like keep up with uh, uh, looking through a book for taxonomy. Um, it takes hours sometimes to find the diatom that I want. Um, usually I can do it in a couple of minutes, but um, but to be sure what you're looking at uh, would require some pretty si serious effort. Um, there's a whole bunch of sloughers that were originally described by Mueller, like 1903, 1905. Um, he's a really famous diatomist from Germany who came, I think he's German, came through Africa and collected a whole bunch of samples from Malawi, Tanganyika, and the lakes around it. And um, uh, described a ton of species from Africa. So a lot of the endemic species uh, were first described by Mueller in, in the East African Rift, especially the Southern East African Rift, uh, where they were. And I have all the original um, German um, articles, scientific articles for those Mueller things. And one of the first things I did as a PhD student was um, well, I guess it was after I was a PhD. When I finished with my PhD, it was translate all of those from German into English so I could figure out what he was trying to tell us because I was working on Lake Malawi at the time. And so I have all these like translated, um, translated from German using, I don't know, Google Translate or something. And then uh, I tried to get some of it checked by friends of mine who were German <laughs> as much as they would put up with, hey, what's this say? But a lot of the original taxonomists were German, and so um, Husted and, and, you know, like, like most of them came out of Germany for diatom work. And this is looking pretty good. All right, uh, beam intensity can go down to seven. And it's looking real sharp. Okay, I'll take that picture. Um, and I don't speak German or read German, so. Uh, it's probably, if it's a spiral, it probably was a snail, a Yeah, a very small one, yeah. Uh, oh, gel arts. I'll ask her about it. Um, I'm going to, I'll tell her to check it out if she doesn't. Uh, I'm going to message it to my wife and then she'll be like, what's this? That's not what I wanted. It just auto-corrected it. Um, we'll definitely check it out, though. Oh, SRL has watched some of the videos. Cool. Um, shop safety is important, yeah. You have extra fingers, though. Uh... Do I have extra fingers? I feel like I just have the normal amount. Um, you mean I have some I could lose? Hello, studio. How are you doing? Uh, also, hello, Kalathon. Uh, let's see. Studio. Studio Cornix. Um, is an artist. I got a lot of artists. Um, for some reason, artists are drawn to my channel of weird science stuff. Uh, I think it's because diatoms have such interesting textures, and um, the fact that they're invisible without a microscope, and that they... Um, I think it's that they're so charismatic. That's the way I like to think of it. The diatoms just have a great charisma. They've got all these tiny little textural things that uh, that appeal to artists be my guess that's what I'm going with artists out there can uh, argue with me if they want put forth a different idea I think uh, little Chuke just like to listen to the SEM hum I think she's just like the white noise aspect I haven't seen Little Cheek for a while. 
tiny living sculptured opals. Yeah. True. Factual statement. How are things going, studio? Hey, Anna, hello. How are you doing? Happy New Year. Um, I know you saw I, I um, got a picture of a snowy owl uh, over break. Because I'm sure you saw it on Facebook. Slafra SP internal. Uh, I knew if I put a Slafra up on the screen that I could get Anna to show up. She loves Slafra and uh, and she's always excited when I call something a Slafra. And uh, this time, no exception. That is definitely a Slafra down there. Uh, and I won't brook any argument uh, about that <laughs> this time. Uh, all right, let's zoom around. Um, I'm going to hop over to... Is it 3 o'clock already? Uh, I'm going to hop over to a different stub. I feel like I've convinced myself that that thing that I was looking at is not an Aphrosimbella, but it's also not not an Aphrosimbella. Probably it actually belongs somewhere as a sister taxa to it. And my guess is that eventually Itzi and I will get around to moving it where it belongs. Because um, it doesn't belong with a typical Gumpanema, in my opinion. Uh, what's this round guy? Is it Kukkanese? Nope. It's a Cavinula, I believe. Definitely. It's a gorgeous diatom. It's a Pseudoscutiformis. Or something in that group. I need to turn it a little bit. I'm going to get a picture of it. Let's go backwards five, seven degrees. Not far enough. Better. See what we can do about getting these little tiny holes in focus. Ooh, there's something interesting inside. They come with presents. Fix the brightness and contrast. I'm looking for a full-time job again. Daytime streams may be more difficult for me to attend in the near future. Uh-oh. I saw you went to Texas and you uh, 
landed a ton of new birds. Uh, when I was a, a young, naive diatomist uh, in 2000, I took the diatom, I went to diatom training camp in Iowa, and I was taught diatom taxonomy by uh, Jane Stormer, uh, a little Charlie Reimer, uh, but mostly Gene Stormer and Sarah Spaulding and Mark Edlin were the TAs, basically. And uh, after four weeks of learning diatoms, Gene Stormer asked me, all right, you've got like 100 diatoms that I'd identified over that four-week period and put into a database for them and whatever else. And uh, what's your favorite diatom? And I said, this one, Gavinula pseudoscutiformis. Uh, because I thought it was the most recognizable diatom out of all the diatoms that I had seen. I felt like this was the one that was easy to tell what I was looking at. Like, you could easily tell what it was. And I never would have any trouble identifying it. I thought, that's so easy to identify. It just it looks so characteristic, basically. Um, not my favorite diatom in terms of, like, the coolest looking one, but... Um, let's see. I just checked an eBirds Illustrated checklist for my country has several photos I submitted. Oh, nice. Well, that should make you feel good. That's an achievement. Um, I probably don't have many birds that are like, pictures are so great that people would have used them for something um, that other people don't have images of anyway. Cosmo Quest, with the big raid. Um, thank you for bringing people in again, Cosmo Quest. I feel like every time I stream, I get uh, in the afternoon, I get a Cosmo Quest raid, and it's uh, a delight. Thank you for bringing people in. We are looking at diatoms from Africa. These ones are. <laughs> And thank you for the follow, Astro YYZ. Um, I should point out, we are at uh, 2,496 followers. Uh, I am four followers away from a round number. If you're into numerology, uh, oh, three, three followers away from that round number now. Thank you, Smurf Berry Barbecue. Um, which is great uh, to have a bunch of followers. Uh, I'm not that big into numbers, so if I had 2,497, 2, I would be just as happy as if I had 2,500, but um, Twitch rounds it up for me anyways and says I have 2,500 followers. So it's got a very scientific view of it, like, you know, close enough, round up. Um, but for like a year, a year and a half I've been streaming, that's a pretty good uh, list of followers, I think. We do okay. Uh, I took a longer than normal picture. This is a 10 minute exposure, so I apologize, but I love this diatom and uh, the texture on the surface just looks amazing. And in order to get that detail, I need to take a slower picture. So we've got six minutes of just chilling. Um, chilling and chatting uh, to, to, to go through. Um, 
in any case, uh, I'm trying to get ready for the semester. I've got um, four classes I'm teaching this semester. Nice. Nice, Anna. Um, and one of them is something I've never taught before, so... Yeah, the texture is pretty cool on this diatom. How's it going, Veronica? Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to... Uh, this is... Cosmo. If you're not following CosmoQuest, you should. And... Uh, check out their news. Um, they do a really cool podcast. They're running all the time on Twitch because they have like several people who contribute. Oh, a subscription. Thank you, Veronica. Um, you know, I, I never push people to subscribe. Um, I'm always happy when people do, and I'm glad that we're able to give people all these cool emotes that we have, um, the in-channel ones as well as the ones that you can use uh, whenever. So we have like a ton of these emotes, right? Like these things. And... Um, some of those are my original drawings and some of those are my original photos. Um, all things that, um, that we've done basically on stream here. And um, I should point out for people who aren't subscribers that uh, I don't take any of the money from Twitch Home. The money goes directly into a little account that I use to buy stuff for the lab um, and to pay for student research so um everything that comes in <laughs> a little tardigrade one uh the that's a in channel emote this one um i, I had tardigrades on i did a, a light microscope stream from home i don't know saturday i think or sunday um I did a little light, live action light microscope stream um, just to dust off the microscope a bit and uh, look for water bears. And we saw some really cool ones. Um, these uh, red armored ones that are sort of medium sized. And then uh, I got these, I got a really, really big one. Um, and then we had these little ones that I usually see, but the really big one was kind of interesting. And uh, some cool rotifers. Saw some ciliates, a bunch of nematodes, the regular. Um, I collected some sticks from my driveway and from the roof of my house. That's where basically I, uh, I would put those on. My koi pond is sort of variously frozen over and, um, and open right now. So um, sometimes I could probably get stuff out of it. And there's probably some diatoms still living. But a lot of the really like active animals, like the um, amoeba and ciliates and things like that, are probably... probably um, not very active in the winter time. Now the temperatures are basically sort of fluctuating, fluctuating around freezing at night, and um, and in the day even uh, right now. I think today it's almost freezing here. Almost. almost forgot what I was doing. I'm looking for the temperature. I was trying to figure out exactly how cold it was here. Hmm. Just above freezing right now. But it was like late summer temperatures not long ago. Uh, AMO. AMO. Becknarn. I don't know what Amo is supposed to mean. Oh, you're speaking in another language to me. Uh, 
you don't have a lot of luck with finding them. I never had any luck finding water bears until um, until I started looking at sticks. Uh, I tried just finding moss. Like, I thought, oh, they're named moss piglets. You should look in moss. And there's all kinds of places where you could get moss. Um, cool, dude. I wish I knew what you were trying to tell me, though. I don't speak this language. Uh, and then I just started looking at sticks, uh, scraping the lichen off of sticks. And this stuff is maxed out. Swedish. Yeah, I mean, so I looked all over in the moss, and I never found any uh, in the moss itself. So, uh, and I tried looking at lichen on tree bark, thinking that that would be a good place, because there's a lot of lichen on tree bark. And, um, pseudo scutiformis. Um, that also didn't work. Never found any. And then for some reason when I switched to sticks, just like sticks laying around my yard, sticks in the driveway, sticks on the roof, I got all kinds of stuff. So, not sure why. Uh, I really don't know why sticks seem to work, but nothing else does. But, um, I don't think I've picked up a stick in the, um, since I first started looking at sticks, that hasn't had at least a few uh, water bears mixed in with the um, sample's got a lot of stuff going on. Let's jump over to this one. What's in two? Oh, uh, Turn the beam intensity up and fix the brightness and contrast settings. And then we'll take a look at this. This sample's from a similar site to the first one, but uh, this one's from 2018 and that one was from 2017, I think. So um, there's a giant Cirella here, this sort of peanut shaped thing. And then that's a uh, Stephanodiscus, I believe. Sorry, this gives me a chance to actually get it into a little bit better focus. I gotta fix the beam intensity again. good. Um, Sinitzia? It is. A little pointy Nitzia and a tiny little Nitzia. This one's kind of cute. For Nitzia. You can see the Rafi. The giant Cerarella. This big thing is a sponge spicule. This is what's called a megasclere. It's bigger than 100 microns. That's the terminology for it. And uh, Paraplecanes, I think. Yeah, that's a Paraplecanes. It's a really cool one. 
look at the uh, sort of braided nature of this stry. This is what's called biseriate, by the way. So we had a uniseriate as an example for stry. Biseriate stry, there's two um, stry in the row, two different kinds that are adjacent to each other. They alternate back and forth. So this is what's called this sort of braided looking pattern is biseriate stry. And it is characteristic of paraplecanese. Um, it's not the only feature, but if it looks like plecanese, which this one does, and then it has biseriate stry paraplecanese. This is a cool one. Uh, let's see, I want 45 degrees from this, so... Somewhere around there. Rotating it takes it a little out of focus, so I'm just gonna come back and tighten that. Very cool looking central area. Is there like isolated stride? There's a bunch of like weird little stigma like structures almost. There are so many weird paraplecanese in Malawi and Tanganyika, and I'm sure everybody's got the names wrong on these things. They at least got them in the wrong genus. Look at that. Cool. All right, let's... Um... Let's take a picture. Uh, do you, you mean my mossy roof is full of water bears? Probably. Um, uh, I just collect the sticks, and the sticks have, like, lichen on them. Like, all sticks basically have some lichen on them, but the old sticks that fall off of a tree, basically, um, onto your roof or onto your driveway, if you live in a neighborhood with a bunch of old trees like I do, um... That's usually where I find them. And uh, I've never had any trouble finding since then. Um, one of the problems that, uh, that I started out having trouble with is getting a microscope that's low enough magnification. So like all of my scopes are geared towards diatoms for the most part. And so they need to have 1000X or 40X minimum and uh, that's times 10, so that's 1,000 or 400 times magnification. Um, and I needed to get a magnification that was like a 10x objective or 100 times magnification in order to really start seeing them well, because um, I was a little too zoomed in. So it took forever to look through samples. Yeah, I'm sure that they have some. Uh, sticks that fall on the ground are are my recommendation for um, for water bears, and then I just take a like a dull knife and I kind of scrape the lichen into a dish, and um, and then I fill it with a little bit of rope pure water. Uh, you could use distilled water. I don't recommend using tap water if your tap water has chlorine in it, because um, it'll probably kill them. But uh, a little bit of um, distilled water or rope pure water and uh, wait five minutes, stick it on a microscope. Um, I, had to, I had to kind of look through it for a while, like every other sample um, maybe would have it. And I usually just put them on a, um, a slide with no cover slip and I'll just pipette like all over the surface of it so that it's like the whole, almost the whole slide um, available for surface area because typically um, I have to look along through a lot of it in order to find them. 
but uh, usually there's nematodes and rotifers and water bears together, and you know they're they're pretty uh, commonly found around together. So, but that was my uh, big change was just switching to sticks, and somehow that that mattered enough to make it work. So. This is a internal view of Paraplacanes. A cool one. Should really fix that. It's going in the wrong folder. see what else is in this sample. It's like some cool stuff. This is an ensinema. This is super weird. Symbelanitia? <laughs> uh, not Gonfanitia, but Cymbelanitia? Maybe? It looks like a, uh, a little apple pie from McDonald's from 10 years or 20 years ago. I don't know if they still sell apple pies at McDonald's, but uh, apple turnover, basically. Uh, let's see, this is... Let's try zero? Come back wherever you went, weird thing. Ah, oh, here. That's a weird diatom. Uh, most Cymbelanitsia are found in active wave areas, uh, living on sand grains and things like that. If that's what this is. I guess I've never looked at one of them in the SEM before. Very cool. Well, we'll get a picture of it and then I'll figure out what it is later. It looks very African. <laughs> You're hungry for empanadas. Uh, I'm hungry for samosas. I should talk my wife into making me some. I don't think we've had samosas for a long time now. It's a super weird diatom. I'd even take one of those little apple pies, to be honest. I think maybe McDonald's stopped selling them because they would heat them up, and then the pie filling would be like lava, and people burn their mouths on them. When we were little kids, in our lunches, they would have these, like, fruit pies um, that you ate Mostly cold, I guess. Like hostess made fruit pies. Roughly shaped like this as well. Uh, like pies with frosting on them? I don't think I've seen those in forever. I guess maybe hostess doesn't sell them anymore. Or maybe I just don't look for fruit pies. <laughs> One or the other. <laughs> um, but they kind of remind me of those little fruit pies. 
Yeah, I think the apple pies from McDonald's were pretty good. I mean, for McDonald's. That is a weird diatom. The first time I saw Cymbella Nitzia, I'm not sure this is Cymbella Nitzia, but I don't know what else it would be. Um, the first time I saw some of them in the samples, I just thought they were a fragment of another diatom. I thought it was just like a piece of something left over because it didn't seem like it was an actual whole diatom. Uh, but that's the Rafi uh, right here. And there's another Rafi branch, I think, on this side, which is really bizarre because I would have expected the Rafi to be on this side. I didn't really need to look at this thing closely and figure out what the heck this is. Look, there's one end of the Rafi, the other end is over there. I totally would have expected it to be up here though. I have to look into it. Super weird diatoms I find by accident. Uh, this is maybe Cymbella Nitsia? I need to phone a friend, I think. We're in the... It's super small and weird shaped. That looks more like a typical Cymbella Nitsia to me. Maybe it was just an external view of it. Huh. Interesting. These are uh, Epithemia. It used to be Ropalodia. There's another giant sponge Megasclear. Another Epithemia. And another one. clay in this sample. It's an interesting view of this amphora. You can see that the um, the raphes are exposed on the same side of the diatom in girdle view. This is the girdle. It's the top valve and the bottom valve. Sorry, that's the top valve, that's the bottom valve. It's a lot of sponge spicules. I didn't really have an objective with this stub. I was just kind of, it was around, so I thought I would take a look at it. Um, it looks like most of the diatoms are either a little dissolved, like this is pretty dissolved, or covered with a little bit of clay. This actually looks like a, um, it's not a stephanodiscus. It's a cyclostephanos. The, uh, the structure goes all the way to the edge. The costi structure goes all the way to the edge and it bifurcates right before the end of the valve in perfect uh, cyclostephanos fashion. Bad this, oh, it's a little too dissolved for me to really like get too invested in. It's a weird view of Aeropolodia, uh, Epidemia, I think. All right, let's jump over to the next one. This is 
or internal sample 93, I think. Uh, there's another Cerverella. That's a cool one. Internal view. And then there's a ton of, that's a Slafra, there's a ton of Cockanies in here. These little oval shaped things are all Cockanies. Epithemia, or sorry, Ensinema, Cockanies. Ah, this one does have um, some really interesting diatoms in it. These things are kind of like the Gonfa monster diatom that we had in in Idaho with a little horn. There it is. That one is a big horn. It's not messing around. That's got a big old horn on it. You can see it's sticking off of the top end, the head pole. And this one also has a horn on it. It looks like it's just on one side. See that? And the shape of the valve is totally different. This stands really tall. This one has like a little tiny like bump where there was a horn, it looks like. Those are cool. Uh, it's a Gomphonema currently. Here's another one. They like to land in the girdle view. Horn. Not really on the other side though, just on one side. What are you? An interesting gonfanema for sure. It's an interesting shape, though. All right, let's rotate this one around. Uh, Maybe? Got a little too far.
brightness and contrast settings are taking a while. I suppose I could just left them alone, but it seemed like they were a little bright up here at the top, and it did adjust darker, so. Perfect. This one's kind of lumpy. It's got a bunch of granules on the surface, but it's a really cool looking diatom. Very strange. Confinema. Single uh, stigma. Very diamond shaped. Very distinct. What are the larger line striations? Uh, the large lines are usually a rafi, or they're just stria sometimes. <laughs> Unicorn. <laughs> uh, the lines in the background are um, uh, boba. Those, sorry, I should give a shout out to boba while we're here. Um, I can spell. Uh, the lines in the background are um, the stubs that the samples are on, which are, uh, let's see, I think you can see these. They're these little, uh, these little sort of structures. And if you look at the surface of these very closely, um, to get the metal um, cut in a perfect circle with a flat face, they milled it. And um, so they have little circular mill markings on them. And even if I put in a blank stub, it would have those little lines. They're just mill markings from the metal when they cut the, the, um, the little stubs. So um, they're basically, you know, they chop them and then basically they grind them to be flat. Um, so those are from the grinding process. flatten the flattening grinding process um, and they've got little flecks and stuff on them those are from like in the background those are from clay uh, particles probably that are sitting on the surface so <laughs> speed lines um, so they're not tree rings uh, and then on this diatom so if you're still watching uh, this is the the bigger line here is called a rafi this one and uh, the little rows of things that are like these little rows the dark holes um, that are sort of slit shaped in this they're lineolate um, these are uh, stria that's what they're called actually and uh, the little slits are called areoli or puncta and then this one is a special one called a stigma, like, you know, in the palm of Jesus stigma. These are, this is 93, yeah. There go. This is a Cockanese. This is the a raphid valve. It doesn't have a raphid, but it does have a sternum that's going through it. This piece right here, dark line, is the central line. guys in epithemia. Uh, 
if we get really close to these areoli, you'll see that they are clover shaped, usually. Well, these ones are really small. This, these little only got two leaves on their clovers. Some of them are three. It's pretty typical for a uh, for epithemia. There's a big ropalodi in the background of epithemia. There's a little one, different species. This one belongs to that same thing as the one that I thought was Afra Cimbella. Not quite right. It has these twisted up ends and a slot shaped raphe that come or stigma that comes off of the um, the central striae but doesn't have the little cat face intermissio weird little diatom wasn't covered with stuff I would take a picture of it. I'll try to find another one. Those unicorns are everywhere. Once you find a unicorn, you just can't get rid of them. This is an internal view of our unicorn, right here. And you'll see why I think that they're closely related. That's the end of the raphe. It does this sort of like left hook with a curl, or right hook with a curl on this side. And then stigma, or stigmoid, comes off of a central stri and is slot shaped and runs down between them but doesn't connect. So to me, that belongs to the same thing that we've been looking at from these other Afrocimbella like diatoms. Currently, that's a gomphonema. Find a clean one of that doesn't have junk in the center area. Uh, I can't remember the name of that species off the top of my head. For some reason I always blink on the name of that one. It's like. Uh, Kilomai, Africana, and this one. I can't remember what the name of this one is, but they kind of go together as a group, all three of those little weird guys. There's another one up there, Girdle View. This 
another one. This one also has junk right in the middle where I want to take a picture. Of course. My choices are girdle view and internal valve view with junk in it so far. <laughs> oh, here's something. Is that the one I saw before? That's an external view. Valve view. Perfect. No junk on it or anything. And this is the horn. That unicorn horn that we saw. It's right there. This one only has one. The ones that we saw in East Africa had two little horns. But this on each valve only has one. And it's really weird where it's positioned. Like, there's the rafi, there's this horn. And it like curls around the horn. So this is the proximal rafi ends. It's a really interesting shape for this diatom. It's like a club, right? This is the uh, the foot pull. The head pulls where the horn is, so like a unicorn. The horn's coming off the top of its head. It's got this huge foot pull area, split with the rafi. Uh, bite cubes, sorry, hang on. Uh, I'll come back to your question in a second. Hello, Pack. Hopefully your mom is doing okay. Um, let me try to get to these. <laughs> Pastry shape. Um, I guess all the diatoms kind of look a little bit like donuts or something, I guess. Or some sort of pastry. Oh, back and already have to leave. Orange boy, hello. Uh, sorry, bite cube. Would I be so kind as to give a simple explanation for what I'm doing, what I'm looking for? I'm looking at diatoms. They're a type of microscopic algae. And um, you can't see them with the naked eye. And they make a skeleton called a frustule. The frustule has two parts. The two parts are called valves, each one independent. Uh, usually they're together but when they die sometimes they disarticulate into two different 
um, valves. So we can see the inside of the diatom when they disarticulate or the outside of the diatom. And we're looking at it on a scanning electron microscope. Uh, a scanning electron microscope uh, uses electrons rather than light in order to see. So uh, everything that you're seeing, it's not downloading an image, it's actually drawing the image by scanning over the surface and um, electrons are coming back to a sensor but just like a flashlight, um, where electrons, where a lot of electrons are coming back towards the sensor, uh, those areas appear bright, and where few come back, they appear dark. So um, holes basically will look dark, and um, edges will look bright. So it gives us the appearance of looking at something as though we're using light, but in fact we're using electrons, which have a much shorter wavelength than light, and that allows us to actually get a lot more resolution for things that are very tiny. So um, it scans over the surface and it gives us topographic information um, and then turns that into a picture for us. And um, I'm doing actual research at the moment. So these are species, some of which we're working on describing and some of which I'm just trying to define uh, what we have observed in the samples. These samples were collected from lakes Malawi and Tanganyika uh, in East Africa. And the samples were prepared, um, they've been in my lab for, I don't know, five years now, um, were collected by my friend Itzi. And we're thinking, we're planning right now to go back to Africa this coming summer. And um, she's been doing all of the collecting for the last five years or so. Um, I think maybe they might have skipped one year, but I'm not positive about that. And, um, and then she's looking at them genetically and I'm looking at them morphologically. And um, she's got all the gene tools and I have the scanning electron microscope. And so together we're working on characterizing uh, many of the diatom species in eastern Africa in these rift lakes which are poorly understood. So this involves potentially describing new species and also um, redefining some of the existing species like this diatom currently is considered gomphonema but um, in reality it's probably not a gomphonema it's probably something else. Uh, and we're working on sorting out what it is exactly. Um, so that's roughly what I'm doing. Just science, basically. And um, the value for diatoms, if you're curious, uh, which are these little algae, is that they make oxygen uh, as much or more than trees and uh, these ones live in freshwater systems and I mostly use diatoms for um, analyzing water quality and um, trying to reconstruct past environments um, but also I need to understand them taxonomically in order to do that so it's a um, sort of a combined approach we need to be able to, to describe them. And then once they're described, use those to help us figure out what we're looking at so that we can characterize changes that we see through time. That would allow me then to um, reconstruct things like drought in the past, which is uh, one of the primary things that we use diatoms for. And I've got several pub published papers in East Africa looking at these diatoms and other ones that are similar to them uh, from these lakes. Um, and so we're working on characterizing the species. It's a very large um, effort that's going to be required to do it will probably take us years um, 
to get through all of the diatoms or even most of the diatoms. Oh. It's another slit shaped one. Slit shaped. Uh, stigma. So I'm particularly interested in a group of diatoms, in a genus of diatoms called Aphrosymbella, and also Gomphonema, and things that are closely related to it. Um, I never thought of myself as specializing in something like that, but I kind of do. So um, mostly focused on those for these samples. sort of like uh, I wasn't trying to to become a specialist in a group but uh, this group is so poorly understood that I keep getting sort of dragged back into it so similar structure to the ray fee on this diatom here's the bent sharply back ends and a slit-shaped stigma associated with a single stri. Same group. I think this one is uh, Gomphonema kilami, named after a, um, a famous diatomist, Peter Killam, who worked in East Africa. And uh, I think rather tragically died early. Um, wasn't exactly young, but um, but unexpectedly died in the field, I think. Um, so it's, I think, a, a good uh, diatom name to name after a diatomist. And um, because he worked in the area and uh, did a lot of really interesting ecology uh, and a lot of his early work I was a really big fan of um, sort of put out a chat book chapter in 1990 that was kind of influential on me when I was doing my PhD um, I mean it came out in 1990 but I wasn't doing my PhD in 1990 but I read it and I thought it was very interesting Um, he was mostly focused on the Holocaustira issues in East Africa, which still exist, um, which never really got sorted out very well, in my opinion. This weird little guy, I'm going to take a picture of, though. First, I need to fix the beam intensity and the brightness. This is a very large diatom. The field of view right now is 100, uh, from side to side is 100 microns. So this is like 120 microns, and uh, which is large for a gomphonema. And our magnification is only around 2,000, 2,500 times. So two and a half times the power of a normal microscope um, where we are. But of course we can zoom in to any level Looks like it'll be good, within reason. All right, studio, uh, we'll see you later. Thank you for hanging out. We're working on it, uh, moving it somewhere else, Anna. It'll happen. Uh, Cobalt, hello. How are you doing? Uh, and Tactical Grace, hello. Change your name back to what it was originally. Okay. Uh, what part of Africa? Uh, we'll, pre we'll be going to um, Lake Tanganyika. And most of the collection for these samples takes place in Zambia. But um, some of it's sort of on the border with Tanzania. So basically the southern, um, southwestern, and, um, and southeastern sides of Tanganyika. Um, 
I think is will, will be the focus. And then I have a meeting, um, the Speciation in Ancient Lakes meeting that's supposed to happen. And I think that's going to be Kagoma, which is a um, major city in the sort of northwestern part of the lake. Um, or almost, yeah, northwestern, I think is a reasonable way of saying that. Um, let's see. One more question. How come the pictures on the right side of your screen are colored? Ah, uh, the ones on the right are images that I colored. Uh, that's sort of my artistic impression of the... Um, the SEM image. So the colors come out of the instrument black and white, and then I try to make them a little bit more appealing or interesting to people by putting false color into them. So that's an imaginary color. They're not even close to the real colors for those organisms because diatoms are mostly translucent. So they don't really have a color, although they do have a, um, a physical color sometimes as light passes through it gets refracted and deflected and um, and it will give them sort of a color uh, to answer your question Cobalt, I don't know which one you were talking about so uh, that happens all the time people ask me questions about the stream and I stream the slideshow and I don't know what it was uh, I can look through them but there's a lot of blue pictures in there, so it's kind of hard for me to figure out which one you meant. Um, I know what it is, regardless, because I took all those pictures. Those are all mine. Um, so I definitely know what it is, if I knew which one you meant. Gomphonema. This is kill ham I? Kill am I? Kill am I. Internal. We need an external view of that, I think. It's a, such a giant diatom, you'd think it would be easy to spot. Oh, well, how about that? Ask and ye shall receive. That's the same diatom. Pretty sure. Let's go back and check. Well, maybe it's not. Oh no, it is. The foot pole is round and the head pole is pointy. Yeah, same diatom. Let's rotate it. Oh wait, let me see. The surface totally covered by clay. I don't think we can actually see anything on this one. It's just covered. It's out here on the edge, and sometimes a little bit of clay gets stuck on the outside edge. That sucks. It was the right diatom. There's the foot pole. It's sort of clay covering right there. All right, let's see if we can find it. Seems like it would be easy, but. Did we look at that one already? That's totally clean. Excellent.
That's our little unicorn. This is the inside view of that giant unicorn Gumphanema. This is the um, proximal raphe end right here, the central nodule. And there is the slit-shaped stigmoid. And on the outside, there's just a hole right here. And then it's associated with a striae. So same pattern we saw in basically almost every gomphonema that I've looked at closely um, that doesn't have, that has a, this um, slit-shaped stigma. Okay, speed, beam intensity. back up a little bit. Good. Good to go. Okay. Hey, Rams Reef, hello. Uh, yes, all diatoms taste like Smarties. I mean, if they were big enough that you could eat them, they would taste like Smarties. Uh, some of them also taste like Pez. Um, I'm building a Pokemon type game with fish aquatic life. Let me know if you're interested. What's the game like? Uh, <laughs> if you want, put some diatoms, send me some diatom pics and name some info. And if you want a web address where people can look it up, well, that's easy to do. Uh, can we get some Tums flavored? I will talk to them about it and see if we can also get Tums. Or do you have an upset stomach? Did, did diatoms make your stomach upset, dissolution? Um, it's not broke, uh, Cobalt. That's just the way it looks. Um, and Orange Boy, have I found new ones from Africa? Yes. Um, I'm in the process of describing five new Afrocymbella, and I think we have nine new Diplonies, and we might actually have a um, Capartigramma that we don't know what the species is, but um, we haven't described yet. And then I'm pretty sure that Itzi has sh shared a lot of her collection with um, another diatomist, um, and they've looked through them, and I think they believe that there are hundreds of new species. Um, <laughs> still working on that one to answer you. <laughs> Only the orange ones. Um, it's not broken. That structure, Cobalt, I don't know what it does. Um, I I wish I knew the answer to that question. The problem is that everything that we're looking at is dust-sized. And it's a really hard to get a grasp on, like, what's the diatom doing with this thing? Because uh, in order to see it, we have to put it into a scanning electron microscope, which means we have to get rid of all the organic matter and plate it with gold and stick it in a vacuum, which kills everything. Um, you know, it's possible that people can figure out what some of those things are based on its location. Um, but I don't know that anybody knows the answer to that question. It's not just that I don't know the answer. I don't know that science knows an answer to your question. And um, we've had this question before, but the little horn, the unicorn horn on the outside of this thing, like, what's that useful for? I don't know. No one knows. Uh, as far as I know. It's a, it's a challenge, you know, to try to figure that out. Uh, this is the unicorn. Unicorn internal central nodule. And then I'm going to zoom out to do the whole diatom, but I also need to turn it. 
uh, I don't know, a little too far. That's good. It's like a, it's a very specific shape. Like, um, like if you cut it off right here, it could be a bowling pin, but it's not quite a bowling pin. It's a very weird shaped diatom. And I can't believe how clean this one is. It's just, there's nothing in it except for a little bit of schmutz up here. Good. Looking at weird, cool diatoms from Africa. It's a, a early week in January. Yeah, it's a club-shaped disc, but like club with a point on the top, right? It's kind of a weird shape. <laughs> Playing with gold sound, it's less fun than you think, Cobalt. Uh, I put it in the machine over there. And then I start a timer and push some buttons and it comes out a little bit more gold than it went in. Uh, it's usually running, but I just went to work so you can't turn it back on. Okay. Send me a link into the Discord ramps. Um, and I can send you all kinds of pictures if you'd like. Uh, and I can put them up someplace if they're not. Uh, the problem is, like, if I start adding diatoms, it'll take over your whole game. So, <laughs> um, uh, a few popular ones. I, I mean, diatoms are, like, are there popular diatoms? Nobody knows what they are but me uh, and some other nerds. Um, right, we don't want to hurt their feelings. Could it be like a belly button scar? Uh, no, uh, Cobalt, they don't have belly buttons. Um, diatoms don't give birth. Uh, well, they do sort of. The, the parent splits in half, and each child gets one half of the parent. So, like, imagine if your mom split in half... And, uh, and then half of her went to your sister and half of her went to you and then your mother disappeared. Um, so there's no, yeah, like, oh, a throwing knife. That's a, that's a good one. Uh, dissolution. They're very much like throwing knives. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen those, but it does very much look like a throwing knife or a knife blank or a fish without a tail. Could be. Uh, did I just give anybody, like, a horrifying nightmare of their mother being split in half and then half of their mother being, like, one side of their face and half of their mother being one side of their sister's face? <laughs> um, Anna, I'm here looking at hundreds of Platessa Houstonii, and I need different samples. I'm sorry for you, uh, but Platessas are kind of cool. Uh... Kyle XY is diatomaceous, I guess. Um, could it be a scar from the split? No, they don't have scars. The diatom is already split in two. It's got like a little bit of chintzy duct tape kind of structure around the outside. And when it splits, this rigid parts just stay rigid. And a new part grew on the inside before they split apart. So for each valve, it already formed the other half of the what would be its final skeleton for the next generation um, inside, so facing the opposite direction. So then when they split apart, they just 
take take half. Um, yeah, it looks like a throwing knife to me. Um, it's definitely not a scar though, and it doesn't occur in any um, in every diatom, so that's another issue that uh, defeats that idea. It it only occurs in um, like a subset of diatom genera. Okay, uh, let's see. We looked at the um, the central area. Now I'm going to look at the foot pole on the inside. And um, this little structure, which is called the Holictoglossa, which we talked about earlier, if you were here earlier. Um, and Holictoglossa just means a rolled tongue, like that, uh, which is the shape, right? Uh, and then this is the raphi. It ends in the holictoglossa on the terminal side, uh, on the inside of the diatom. And these little uh, vent-like things up here are the foot pole, um, the apical pore fields. And the raphi on the outside splits those, which is why there's a little bit of silica here. So while on the inside it ends here, on the outside it continues right through that pathway. And you can see some of the little holes from the apical pore field, they wrap all the way around the outside edge. So trying to get like a handle on the structure, and then this is a pseudoscepta. Uh, and it looks like there's an actual septa as well on this one, but there's a pseudoscepta right here. Which is just like a little lip uh, of silica. And you can see inside of these little rows, the dots, uh, the areoli, little holes or puncti. Right? Each one of those has like a dark area on the inside of them, a bunch of little dots and rows. So you get a nice sense of what it looks like. And then the structure um, here is the sternum. Back to work. Uh, Discord is a good place to get a hold of me, sure. Constabel, wait, Rams, if you don't know, wait, why didn't that work? Is it just Ram? There we go. Uh, Rams got a, uh, a reef with shrimp and fish in it, uh, and it's going like 24 seven. So you should definitely go check them out. And it sounds like they got a cool new game. And also our friend Constababble is here. Um, I'm not sure why that, popped out with a uh, artist back alley. Oh, I guess because it's got ABA in your name. Oh, it's in your bot channel. Okay. Um, and Constabubble is a science communicator, one of our favorite people on Twitch, um, who holds up the emotes. Um, when things happen in her channel. She's got artisanal uh, emotes, hand-drawn artisanal emotes. Um, she doesn't like protractors? Why don't you like protractors, Constababble? Oh, look, we got all kinds of people coming to visit us. I hope everybody's had a great New Year's, by the way. If I didn't mention it, um, Happy New Year's. Um, for Constababble, for Ramsry, for all of our streamer friends, for all of our followers who hang out, for you lurkers who are out there who just want to hang out, listen to me talk, and watch cool pictures go by. <laughs> Without them, you couldn't celebrate new followers. Um, also, hello, uh, Devil and Mrs. J. I'll do that. Let's more emotes pop out. I'm glad to be back home and uh, streaming again from the SCM. And um, potentially we'll be streaming from my wood shop sometime this week as well. We'll see how it goes. Uh, I got new toys, so 
I'm going to make some new toys as a result. And uh, I can't believe it's 4.30. How long have I been streaming? It's listed somewhere. You're not so glad to be home? Uptime. Two hours and 30 minutes I've been at it. Oh, it's getting close to my log off time then, I guess. Uh, eventually, I'll probably have to find somebody to raid. Maybe another 15 minutes. We'll see what else I can get a picture of. This is nice. This is Unicorn Internal Foot Pull. And let's do the head pull while we're here. So we have all the parts. Not just most of them. Perfect. Okay. The um, description of species usually requires us to have the head pole, the foot pole, central area, internal and external views. I should really get a picture of that horn while I'm here, but I think I have other pictures of it. Uh, yeah, this is a unicorn diatom. Um, you should take a shower. That's up to you, Cobalt. Um, <laughs> it's at least partly up to you anyway. Uh, we'll see you next time. Uh, do you want me to show you why I think it's a unicorn? Um, give me a second, uh, Constabevel, and I'll show you what it looks like from the outside. This is an internal view of the diatom, but coming off of its head is a single horn, like, like sticking up into space. Uh, very much like a unicorn. I mean, it's mostly up to you. I suppose if you start to smell too badly, people might complain. Uh, then you still have to make a decision, I guess. It's kind of still up to you. Unless you're in prison, in which case they might be able to force you to take a shower. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how prisons work, actually. I've never been in one. But, uh... Probably they force you to take a shower occasionally. This is the head pull of our unicorn, an internal view. This is the uh, Lictoglossa again. This is the Rafi coming in. These are stri. These little holes are puncti. This is the sternum. These little slots that are um, creating the gaps for the stri are called costi. This is a pseudoscepta right here. So you'll be so versed in diatom taxonomy and the terminology of diatoms after watching my show for like an hour, you'll be like, <laughs> every one of those words, you'll just be like, I'm no, I know what that is already. Uh, and then think of the conversations you can have with people. I'm sure there's a bunch of people out there will be fascinated to hear about the different parts of diatoms. Um, your parents, for example, or your kids. Uh, and you could just pull it out at a party, you know? Draw some pictures of diatoms. I don't do it. Because uh, I figure people are just expecting me to do that at a party. Usually at a party, I just kind of sit in the corner and watch people, you know. Try to figure out why I'm at a party. And not home somewhere else. Alright, there's the head pull, internal. Let's go see if we can find the, the unicorn horn and get a picture of it. For Constabevel.
Wrong diatom. Zoom out. Ah, right diatom. This is the same diatom in girdle view or side view so that you can see what it looks like on its side, like valve view, girdle view, right? Side view, profile. That's what it looks like in profile. See? Unicorn horn on both sides. That's what the diatom looks like. In side view, there's the foot pull. Here's the head pull. You can see they have like a wedge shape, like an orange slice. Um, in girdle view, that is characteristic of gonfanemoid diatoms. And I want to rotate it backwards just like, I don't know, 10 degrees. We'll see what it does. We'll look at 10 degrees and see what happens. Pretty good. There's the apical pore field. We'll take a look at that in a second. But there's the head pull. Actually, let's go take a look at it right now. Why wait? Uh, these little holes in the apical pore field down here. So the terminology apex means the top or the bottom, right? The ends. Um, pore, little holes field. There's a whole bunch of them. So the terminology apical pore field or APF on the foot pole for these diatoms, it's where it squeezes out stuff and it uses it to attach to stuff, usually rocks, but maybe plants or other diatoms or something. And they grow these long sort of stalks. They live out on the end of the stalk. So that's why we call it the foot pole because it's basically the bottom of the diatom. Uh, it doesn't look like a foot, but it it is where the stalk comes out when they grow stalks, and gonfanemoid diatoms typically grow stalks. So we'll get a picture of the foot pull up close, like you can see this is a girdle band here. There's another one. And then this is one valve, and this is the other valve. And so if you're going to split your mom in half and take half, and this one will take the other half of mom, um, this is the the division is already there. Speed seven. Good to go. Take a quick picture of that. Uh, they only look like devil horns because you're looking at them from the side. So like if you had your face and then like a Janus, you know, there was a second face on the back of your head and you each had a horn. Then uh, like if it was a unicorn that had a head facing this way and another head facing that way, because uh, that's the way diatoms are shaped. There's like a face pointing off of both sides. Please stop with the mom metaphor. <laughs> Having a horn on both sides defeats the definition. No, it's if a unicorn had two heads, you know, because the diatom has two valves. It's got two faces. So it's like Janus. The, uh, I think he's like Roman, right? Uh, had a face and then had a second face on the back of his head. And then each of those had a horn, a single horn coming off their head. So, you know, a dual unicorn, yeah, Smurf. Or a dual corn disc, not, not like this. This is the devil, right? They've got horns coming out like two on one side. It just got one, and then there's another face on the back of its head that also has one. A conjoined unicorn, conjoined unicorn is what it is, really. Uh, I think is the best way of describing it. I mean, I'm not an expert in unicorns, but I think it's more of a unicorn than a devil. Sam, how's it going? Uh, sorry, I missed some stuff up here, I'm sure, because we were talking about unicorns. <laughs> Involuntary hosing down. <laughs> I'll take your word for it, Boba. Uh, is there such a thing as busy season in my career field? Yes. Uh, Brendan, whenever 
the students leave and go home, that's my busy season, uh, believe it or not, because I have a lot of work that needs to get done. And when they're not around, my life gets a lot easier. I can just do research, go home, hang out with my family, come back the next day and do research. Um, and that's my busy season. Uh, but actually, it's very difficult to also teach and do research and mentor students and um, uh, write papers and everything else basically at the same time. So um, a better question, is there ever a time when I'm not busy? Uh, to which I could answer last week is basically the only time all year long where I just go hang out at my parents and try to avoid COVID, you know? That's basically all I did last last week or Christmas between Christmas and New Year's. That's all I did. Nothing basically. So uh, external foot pull. And zoom out in. I get the sense that Anna doesn't want to have half of her mom, like literally half of her mom. She didn't like my metaphor. What if it was your dad though? What if it was like your dad split in half and you got half a dad? Half dad, half you. Look at that cool double humped horn. That's got a flare to it. Uh, <laughs> Google Tom Jobs. Uh, we're taking applications for grad students. So if you wanted to work in my lab as a student uh, and learn diatoms, the, uh, the grad student applications deadline is January 15. Uh, it requires you have an undergraduate degree, though. Just throwing that out there. Doesn't matter in what. Uh, job of diatoms is making the oxygen that you breathe. Yes. Um, that's part of their job. <laughs> conjoined. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> conjoined unicorn into Latin. <laughs> <laughs> Unicorn's attack. <laughs> it's like a double rainbow. Uh, hey, oh, it hasn't upped my count. It still says I have 2,496 followers. I'm four away from uh, breaking the 2,500 limit. Or it's not a limit, but the number. I hope it's not a limit. Shut ins unite, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we need to use diatoms to make face masks. It's not a bad idea. Uh, I'll answer any question as long as it's related to diatoms or my work. I don't mind uh, talking about those things. <laughs> How many hours of watching streams equals one credit? It's a good question. Uh, well, a typical credit is like a one credit class expects you to have one hour of class time and three hours of non-class time. So four hours, basically, is roughly equivalent to four hours in one week probably would be roughly equivalent to one credit. And if you multiply that over 16 weeks, which would be a semester, right? So that's like 64 hours is roughly for a whole semester. Doesn't matter in what? No, it doesn't. Um, if you're interested in science, you don't need to have an undergraduate degree in science. Um, that's not required. My, one of my closest friends got a degree in photography, in art, photography, fine arts. And now she's a diatomist who works in University of Toledo. 
and she does uh, diatom DNA and looks at ancient DNA from uh, lake cores and um, she came into her master's degree with just that um, fine arts degree so uh, if, if it's something you want um, you don't need to have a science degree in order to go to grad school for science um, you do need to have a pretty you know significant interest in science and you might have to take some remedial courses but um, you know, it, it doesn't really preclude you from moving forward in that path if it's one that you're interested in. Ex express it like that. You can do it. It's totally feasible. Uh, I should have Trisha on sometime, but she's super busy. Not that I'm not, but... Um, I'm also planning on doing an interview. I keep talking to my friend Ryan, who did her undergraduate, no, her master's degree here, and um, is now working on the Salsa project. And we're talking about doing a science interview uh, where I have her come on the stream. That'll probably be this semester. Pretty sure. You'll be applying next semester with your stream watching credits if you can do it. Um, could I explain a little bit about the difference between an SEM, an STM, and an AFM? I don't know what an STM is. Uh, do you mean a TEM? I'm not sure uh, that the exact. Um, the terminology that you're talking about. Um, but a scanning electron microscope fires electrons from above onto a sample. And then the electrons go into the sample and inside they collide with things. I don't know what a scanning tunneling microscope is actually. I have no idea what that is. I don't think we use them in my field. I'm not an engineer. I'm a diatomist. Uh, and then electrons collide with particles, and they get ejected from the surface. Yeah, I know what an atomic force microscope is. Um, and those get collected up here by something that has a positive anode, and it scans across the surface. And so the response that it gives you is topographic in nature. It basically, um, it's like a, a flashlight essentially, using electron as flashlights. So it's reflected electrons, or refracted electrons, or whatever you want to call it, but it's basically like reflected light. So you're getting a topographic view. A atomic force microscope actually has like a, a really thin, I think it's a piece of metal even, um, and it moves around objects and as it gets closer to them, it starts to vibrate with more frequency. And so it uses the vibrations to f feel or sense an object without ever touching it. Um, so it uses those uh, atomic force to actually sort of detect the position of things. And what it creates when you're done is um, a 3D image it basically gives you a sculpted image of these microstructures by, by um, de detecting the force of those um, atoms. So it's a totally different tool, and it basically detects the vibrations of atoms and their atomic forces, and then it turns that into a 3D model. So when you're done with it, rather than having a... Uh, an image, like a photograph, is what we produce with a scanning electron microscope. With an atomic force microscope, you're actually done, when you're done, you have a 3D model. So, okay. Yeah. So, it's a modified STM. It uses electron tunneling to image on an atomic scale. Yeah. It requires the surface to be conductive, so does mine. Atomic force was developed for non conductive surfaces. Okay, that's cool. So, Excellent. 
Um, yeah, so that's the idea, is it uses that... Uh, thank you for the cheer. It uses the, the power of that vibrating sort of sense to get a 3D model of the image or the object. So when you're done, you have a 3D model. You don't have a, a picture. You can take a picture of the 3D model, but it's like you could print it, right? You could take it from there and just print it on a 3D printer. If I tried to print this on a 3D printer, it's a 2D, right? So I only have two dimensions. I could make it into a 3D image by taking a whole bunch of photos um, in a scanning electron microscope and then using photogrammetry to get an approximation of an object. I've done that before. That's what this is. This is a diatom that we created by using scanning electron images only. It's two halves glued together because you have to 3D print things in halves. But um, we took pictures from all different angles around this diatom and then uh, we put it into um, a 3D modeling program that actually interpolates the distance to objects based on the photographs or photogrammetry. And we created a three-dimensional object from that. And then we could print it on a 3D printer. So that's pretty cool. Um, you can do that. It, took, it takes a lot longer. It took me, to get this model, I took 75 photos. Um, and it was actually only half of it, right? So we only did half because we could only see half of the diatom at a time. Uh, and then we did some clever cropping and glued the two pieces together. And I pull them apart occasionally because they're just stick glued together. But, um, but you can create a 3D model from SEM images or from anything where you have enough pictures of it. Uh, but each of those pictures took me five minutes to collect, and then there's 75 of them. It's a lot faster to, to get a 3D model from Atomic Force. So that's generally what it is. I mean, again, you're asking me a question about something that's pretty far outside of what I do, but I've used an Atomic Force microscope. Well, I've watched it used, let me put it that way. Um, one of my colleagues, at uh, St. Cloud, Matthew Julius has access to an atomic force microscope that was donated to his department. And we put some diatoms on there. And um, I was going to publish a paper about it, but he never held up his end of that deal. So if you're out there listening, Matt Julius, I still remember from 15 years ago, uh, we still have a species we need to describe, actually. Um, but that's the general sort of model for it, uh, as I understand it. So, you know, simplified version of what's going on. But they're, they produce different things. Um, and then there's also, like, a transmission electron microscope, which is basically like the scanning electron microscope, except for rather than getting a topographic response, it's more like a transmitted light microscope where the electrons go all the way through the object and then the sensor's on the opposite side, like a typical um, upright light microscope has. That is the unicorn diatom again. There it is internal view, there's an external view in profile. There's another one of these guys somewhere around in these samples that's, it's not Kilomai and it's not the little unicorn guy. It's a different one. Uh, I think it's Africanum, but I don't remember seeing it recently. I think I've seen it in some of these samples before, but it's not in this one. All right. We got the uh, roughly 10 minutes before uh, 5 o'clock, and I should probably go home today. I got the uh, woodshop stuff calling me. I got to figure out how to use a biscuit joiner in my spare time and, uh, and build a table and then a box. I've got to learn how to use a, uh, a box joiner. So I've got tasks, you know. I've got an eight-year-old who, almost eight-year-old who 
needs me to build things for her. Well, it's got a cool surface to it. Looks like just a regular old Confinema, but like a cool looking one again. Cool shape. This is that same weird structure as we saw before from a similar shaped diatom, maybe the same diatom from earlier in the stream. is that same diatom. Internal, external. This is a really cool ensignema. Alright, so yeah, I got time for one more picture. I probably should get going. I got a bunch of work stuff to do still that it's like the boring parts of my job, like trying to put together four classes, which is like class course programming sort of stuff, you know? Ooh, well, that's an interesting shape. Same structure. Slit shaped Rafi. This one almost looks like Afro Symbella. Except for it's super long. Too far back. little weird guy. We'll get a picture of the inside of him. Her? It's a her. Uh, in the sense that whole gomphonema are female. By Latin. Okay. Uh, yeah, there you go. Thanks for that link. Crawl, fang, and claw. Is there a market for 3D printed diatoms? A uh, small market, yes. Um, we created some 3D models and shared them to um, Thingiverse. So um, if you are looking to print some diatoms, we have some up there for free. And um, this one, if you wanted to print this one, I can give you the um, STL for that as well. Photos in the two sort folder are calling you. Good luck with that. Uh, I really enjoy your channel. So many neat things. Thanks for putting in the time. Thank you. 
Feng and Claw. Thank you for coming and for the bits and for the questions and for hanging out. Um, I do a bunch of different things. I don't mean to. Uh, just my habit, I guess. I have pics of the rarest birds in the States. There was ever only one. Still is. Biscuit trainers aren't very hard. You have a scrap to practice on. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go home and practice. But I got to get out of the box first, you know? It's like brand new. You like to join biscuits with butter. That does sound good. I'd like to join them with a little bit of honey. Cosmo Voyager X. Greetings, people of Earth. Congratulations on completing another orbit. We did not think you would make it. <laughs> I'm not sure we were going to either. <laughs> How about those tardy grades put into state of quantum entanglement? First life forms. Yes, I did see that. I do not see a link to your uh, diatoms NFTs because uh, I don't make NFTs. Uh, the pictures that are in here are on Instagram, though, if you wanted to look at them. <laughs> I don't sell them uh, or monetize them or whatever it is you do with NFTs. Uh, I just give stuff away to people for science, for free. Uh, views, art, whatever. Um, if you want super high resolution ones, if you want to own the originals, uh, I guess I could give them to somebody. Um, I don't know, if people want to buy them, they'd have to tell me what they're willing to, to spend. Um, Okay, uh, I'm gonna just mark this little weirdo down. Uh, internal uh, SP. Don't know what that is. I don't have any idea what this is. I know it's a gumphenemoid. That's as far as I can get. Uh, speed four, beam intensity 10, not 120. Fingers. Uh, let's get us one last thing to take a picture of. And then... Oh, hello, what are you? Oh. This is the other weird one. It's like the Africana one. This is the one I hadn't seen in a while, I think. Yeah made an appearance uh, let's go seven rotate uh, 160 maybe mm, could go back a little farther uh, science does need funding by the way I agree with that statement um, uh, but my science art doesn't and if you wanted to fund science I guess subscribe to the channel or just donate to the channel I guess if you wanted to do it by owning something I could sell you something but probably better if you just became a science sponsor then I could name a diatom after you think of how cool that would be I also want to get a picture of this little guy that's pretty cool might be a little bit late coming home as a result What's the next level of microscope tech coming? Quark scanning, I don't know. <laughs> do I don't need another type. Um, this one's good enough for what I do. Uh, confocal microscopes are pretty neat, but, um, but do we need more technology? I think we need more scientists. And, um, and just more original science, probably, I don't know. Neutrino microscopes, yeah, I guess. We could look at the stars. 
If you could get a sample from anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? Uh, Quiglius, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I get samples from all over the world, and um, I don't really think a lot about like where else I might go. Um, you know, I have samples from the top of the Himalayas. I have samples from uh, from the coolest lakes in Africa. I have samples from uh, South America. I have samples from the western part of the U.S. Uh, I've worked in a lot of different places. I, I mean, I think I'd like just I'd like to go places people haven't been because there's probably lots of cool things in those places um, that haven't been explored. And, um, and I think that, that, uh, there's a lot of room for exploration still in, in what we do in science and in diatoms in particular. Um, a single lake in, in Macedonia, a very large ancient lake in Macedonia, but a single lake there, uh, has produced something like a thousand species of diatoms. And there's a single lake, Lake Baikal, which has probably produced a thousand or more species of diatoms. So large ancient lakes are really interesting places to study. And, you know, so there's lots of cool potential targets for science there. Um, I, get, I think my favorite places would probably still be in Africa, uh, just because that's where I'm, I do most of my work. And so I would like to probably pick one of the East African lakes that's not as well explored. But um, the thing is, I do get to do cool research in, in pretty much any place that I want. Um, but if you get some samples from Mars, I'd be pretty excited to see those. <laughs> Maybe they've got diatoms in them. You never know. Um, uh, or there's some other interesting earth places that might be pretty interesting. Um, there's lots of unexplored stuff out there. What are you? Oh, uh, it's Cyclostephanos, maybe Malawiensis, definitely Cyclostephanos. The costi run all the way to the edge and they bifurcate right before they get to the very edge. So it's a Cyclostephanos. It's covered with little silica granules, but kind of cool. this uh, picture get collected because I'm kind of curious about what this could be and I'm collecting it on a higher resolution than usual which means it's a little bit slower beam but uh, once I'm sure everything is clean I'll start it, and that's a 10 minute photo, but um, it will give me time to say goodbye and thanks to everybody. So um, we had a bunch of cool stuff that happened today. 
Are there ever samples embedded in rock core samples? Yes, uh, Quiglis. We look at the diatomaceous earth around here um, occasionally. I have some ancient samples that are 10 million old, years old that are back here uh, behind us. And um, thank you for the follow aesthetic mayhem. You are follower number 2,497. Welcome in to the Diatom Army. Um, thank you for uh, our follows today. We had follows from uh, John Wick, The Legend 420, Astro YYZ, Smurf Berry Barbecue, um, Petra Damos, and Aesthetic Mayhem. And uh, we had cheers from Crowl, Fang, and Claw and a subscription from Veronica Cure, and we got rated by, um, similarly, from Cosmo Quest X. Um, so thanks for all those people um, for hanging out. So this is like a pretty long SEM session we've had, three hours, and it's time for me to move on to get home and play around with some new toys that I have. And um, uh, we've had lots of cool people hanging out in the chat with us as well. So um, I think what we will do is uh, do a raid to leave for the day. And um, we'll raid somebody that I haven't raided before. Very popular Christmas toys, exactly. Um, See if that worked. We'll go visit Tom Thinks. Uh, he does really cool art on uh, on Twitch. He's friends with our friend um, OpenSet, and uh, he's usually doing something cool. So um, I think it'll be a fun place to go hang out for the people who like art. Um, I don't usually stream on Tuesday afternoons, but um, I had some stuff I needed to eat, some questions I needed to answer. Hello, Shadowfax. Um, so we did that today. I think I got the answers that I was seeking. Um, and then potentially some new questions from that as well. So um, thanks for all the people who hung out, for all the streamers who came in and visited. And, um, uh, you know, if you want to continue the discussion, you can hang out in our Discord. It's this thing. Um, if you want to check out Instagram for all the stuff that we have here. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, science, a lot of art streams and not many science streams, so that's just the way it is sometimes. Um, but uh, some cool music streamers. Um, we'll catch everybody next time. I don't know how soon that'll be. Maybe pretty soon if I figure out my uh, woodworking tools. All right. Uh, we'll see you later. Thanks for, for visiting.